Going inside the issues of our community, this is Local 12 Newsmakers. Good morning and welcome to Local 12 Newsmakers. The economic downturn is having a dramatic impact on every front. Every day, more and more companies announce layoffs. Some entire industries, like the American-owned automobile industry, face incredible pressure that threatens its very existence. The impact of the economic downturn on tax revenues for local and state government dominate the headlines. Ohio Governor Strickland last week announced that uh, there would have to be some major, major cuts of course, the tragic irony is that, of course, it is that at this very moment, more and more families are experiencing increased pressure. The agencies that uh, form society's social safety net are seeing their budgets slashed, resulting in massive layoffs of their own, undermining the ability to respond. This morning, we focus on how that impact is hitting a foundational government agency, the largest private social services agency in the region, and a small grassroots agency. We begin uh, this morning with two guests, Maura Weir, the director of Hamilton County Job and Family Services, uh, which is the underlying local government agency that administers state and federal and local programs for everything from children's services, child support, to food stamps and Medicaid. And Terry Now, the Director of Community Relations for Talbert House. Talbert House is a regional nonprofit network that assists approximately 25,000 people every year with over 30 programs in areas of community corrections, mental health, substance abuse, and welfare to work. Talbert House has been essential to the success of Hamilton County's highly successful and nationally recognized drug and mental health uh, courts. Welcome to Newsmaker Mora. welcome back. Um, this has been a difficult time, and your agency has already experienced a lot of layoffs. Mm -hmm. It's been in the paper. How many people have you had to cut back so far? To date, it's been 180 people. 180 people mm -hmm. out of a total? We were about, we're typically staffed about 1,600, but we actually had started doing some things in anticipation of the budget cuts. We had been hiring freezes and things like that. So we were probably at about um, 1,560 positions. Okay. And looking forward, do you have any sense of, uh, do you know at this point that you're going to have to do more cuts, or are you waiting for the next budget to happen? Well, in reality, we probably, you know, when we started looking at the reductions that we were faced with, we were thinking we probably really need to hit the 352 reduction mark by the end of 2009. But we're really attempting to do some things. We're looking at a buyout, an early retirement package. Um, as well as just natural attrition as people leave, as people retire. So I'm very hopeful that um, at this point we would, wouldn't have to do additional layoffs, but again, it really is dependent upon what happens, as you s mentioned. We're anticipating additional cuts by the governor's office, so we will have to really evaluate those. Um, actually, we're evaluating our budget almost daily in terms of what the impact is and how we can uh, meet the needs of the community as well as meet the budget requirements. Terry. Talbert House is not a government agency as such, but as I look at your annual report um, for 2008, it seems to me, and I don't know how to read all the numbers perfectly, but it would appear to me that even counting uh, United Way and what I think is other private fundraising, that that only accounts for three, four percent of your total budget. The rest of it is government right. contracts. Is that correct? That's Am I correct. Right? Federal, state, and local funding is. We're basically a government contractor. Okay, so you're a government. You're delivering a lot of the services, including services that you would contract with Talbert mm -hmm. House. That's that, uh, That's job and Family Services mm -hmm. would contract with Talbert House, is that right? Yes, and actually um, we have many contracts with many providers in the community. Right. And one of the things that we had to do in anticipation of these reductions is we actually had to cut almost $15 million worth of contracts within the community. So that was a pretty significant mm -hmm. reduction for the community in terms of the services that are provided. How has that impacted Talbert House at this point? Right, well this, you know, economic restructuring is basically what it is. We're, we're waiting and watching because every day these numbers change. You saw the governor came out yesterday with some right. new predictions. Um, and so we are just making, you know, trying to be proactive, taking a business approach to um, 
assess where we are to, you know, we have a hiring freeze right now. So far we have not, we have received budget cuts, but we have not had to lay anyone off. We're a large enough organization that with the hiring freeze, we're hoping we can move people around. And again, um, as people go assess those positions and those kinds of things, we're cutting administrative expenses. Um, and we're looking at efficiencies within our organization. How can we streamline our processes? How can we do more um, and, and be able to serve more people as the need? Just to give people increase. some sense of what it is, not only that you already know about, mm -hmm. but what you may be facing. Um, to estimate, let me, let, there's some things from the governor's office I'd like to focus on. To estimate future tax revenues for the state, the Office of Budget and Management looks at broad economic indicators and then projects into the future. Over the last five months, the estimates of workers' wages has become more and more pessimistic. Look at the difference between the green line, which was made in July, and the purple line, the increasingly pessimistic November projection. That, in turn, is translated into scenarios for future tax receipts, which then fund all these kinds of programs. And the expectation is a sharp drop in the 2009, 10, and 11 revenue. To put this in context, there has never been a time in the past 50 years when the state revenues have declined two years in a row. This shows a three-year decline. So we're talking not about just the usual sort of adjustment here. We're talking about big changes. We are, and for us, actually, it's been a 40% reduction in our funding. So if you think of it, 40%, 40% which is $42 million over the course of um, four, four years. But the most significant reductions were hitting us in 2009, 2010, and 2011. So it really is having a dramatic impact, as well as we saw some other funding that we typically have had received as a county um, has gone away. So we're grappling with many reductions, as well as some funding streams just How and how do you make a decision in that sort of situation, 40%, how do you make a decision about what gets cut? It's very difficult. I mean, the, because we are mandated to do certain things. So at this point, we are still delivering our mandated services. I will tell you it's a stretch, you know, and we continue to look at that. Um, we do many of the same things that, that Terry indicated. We, we, we sure. reduced some contracts. We reduced, um, we cut overtime. We looked at efficiencies within the organization. Um, but you still have to really watch that. I mean, we have to make sure at at the same time these reductions are happening, we're seeing a dramatic increase in the amount of people that need our services. Our food stamps, Medicaid, child care has increased dramatically. They're the highest that they've been actually since we implemented welfare reform. So we're seeing record numbers of folks needing these services at the same time when the funding is decreasing. So you're really trying to balance that. To date, we really haven't had to impact the front line very much. I mean, we really are able to, at this point, serve people. They might have to wait longer. Um, but we really are trying to make sure that we're available and we can meet our mandates. Terry, one of the things about your agency, and the reason I called out the drug court and the mental health court, these are programs that Talbert House has been critical to helping get started that not only are wonderful in terms of what they do for people, but they're economically efficient. It means that people who we would ever otherwise be putting in jail and having and paying thirty thousand a year for, we're helping with four thousand dollars a year. So there's economic savings and things. What happens in the future to programs like that that make economic sense as well? That's what I worry right. about. Well, you know, it remains to be seen what the county budget's going to be passed and, and some of the federal budgets and what's going to happen. Um, you're right. I mean, we agree. It, it's not only that you improve people's outcomes because you give them the treatment that they need to be successful in the community and you have a plan for them to reenter the community and be successful, but it does reduce or eliminate lengths of stay in prison and the costs are, or jail, and the costs are reduced because you have a shorter length of stay. Right. So. Um, we are watching to see what happens. Um, some of those funds are federal funds, some are state funds, um, and they are very highly effective programs. So. Is there anything the state could do, I mean, besides give you more money, but that, <laughs> that they're going to give you less. Is there anything the state could do to help you address this really difficult time? There's a few things, I mean, we, and we've already had some dialogue about some of the mandates. You know, we're mandated to do um, certain functions, so perhaps lessen the time frames associated with those mandates. Um, one thing that comes to mind is work participation, you know, people that are actively engaged in a work activity while they're receiving assistance, you know, helping us figure out how do we meet those those benchmarks. They're great benchmarks to have, but when you see your resources depleting and the, the need in the community increasing, how do we balance that? 
um, as well as you know we would continue to advocate for how the TANF funding is distributed because TANF funding is really it's been a wonderful funding stream for prevention services for many programs about work participation to help keep people get back to work as well as other programs child welfare and child support so we would continue to ask that they consider the alo those allocations and how they distribute those funds mm -hmm. and you say these conversations have started at what level they we've started really through just our various associations as well as I know our commissioners have approached mm -hmm. the governor's office and so we are you know continuing to have those dialogue and I think many of my county part counterparts are also having those same conversations through their board of county commissioners um, the legislatures and the centers Terry, in your case, Talbert House, and people may not appreciate it, but you are the largest sort of private agency of your type in not just our region, but phew, southern Ohio, northern Kentucky, I mean, we're talking huge area. Are you able to go to Columbus, to Washington, as an agency, are you? Is that part of your mission to try to help figure out how to get us through this? Yes, we definitely see ourselves as trying to meet the needs of the community and trying to help problem solve. So, how can we help? You know, whether that's the state officials, the county officials, um, you know, make decisions about you know their funding cuts and their mandates. How can we say restructure our programming to meet their needs to be more effective to try to help them? And and we do try to help, you know, whether that's legislation and working with senator sites around trying to, re some of the mandates around um, drunk driving laws and help people mm. be able to serve in the community versus the jail, which would then free up jail space or, um, you know, all those kinds of options, working with the Hamilton County commissioners about how to help them as they think about closing Queensgate and some of our jail programs and how we can assist them. You know, there's a basic thing, Queensgate jail, whatever the proper name for it is, 800 beds. It's shut down at the end of this month. That's right. Am I right? Yes, I believe so. so. Well, they're still just debating the budget, but okay. But they're, the sheriff's already That's moving nice. in that direction. Yes. So there are mandates that s require people to spend a certain amount of time in jail for very minor sorts of nonviolent things, right. and that, those are the sorts of things that we could begin to That's change. That's where we hope we can be helpful. What yes. can the average person do? What can a person who's just out in the community? Um, do in response to this situation because this is impacting a huge number, a right. growing number of people in our community. Right. I think you're helping do that by educating them. Be educated, understand what their um, key elected officials are dealing with and help advocate for the things and express to them what they feel is important for our community, understanding the parameters they're working in. Um, people are donating. We all have less, but some people have literally nothing and we have seen people um, Walnut Hills High School and a group uh, work group from PNG who are um, um, kind of adopting our clients for the holidays to help give them gifts um, Turner Construction who's looking at a possible project to help us with um, some facilities things so I think the community is generous in that way and you know people volunteering simply tutoring a child whose um, parent is incarcerated or helping someone who has no work history practice interviewing some skills that many people have and may not think that that would be helpful but those kinds of things are helpful. I mean I do think education is critical because I think many people think um, when they come to the Department of Job and Family Services that they're not working and which would be interesting 35 percent of the people that are currently receiving assistance have never been known to us or haven't been known in five years so that really speaks to how the economic situation is but impacting. Go back on that again I'm not sure I caught that 35 percent of the people who are now coming to you that are now coming to us have never accessed our services before or haven't accessed them in the last five to seven years. That really speaks to many people are working and they're really struggling and they might have two or three jobs and they still can't do it or they've lost their job and they're coming to us. So I really think there's you know, people just educating the community about the need. You know, and the, one of the things that really scares me is that six, eight months down the road, there's gonna, it's gonna be some incident with a family, a child, and I hate to say it, but the news media will jump all over it. And then the question will be, how did they fall through the cracks? Mm -hmm. Well, the cracks have gotten very big. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for, for what you do in the community. And we're gonna keep having you back. We're gonna thank keep you. following this. Thank Stay you. tuned. After the break, we turn to a situation for a grassroots organization that provides safe housing for the homeless. <laughs> 